When you dig a little bit deeper into this question of integrated hypocrisy, and I'm going to keep on doing that for the next several um, sub-episodes because it bears witness to the problem and helps us detect it in ourselves too. When you dig into a little deeper this problem of integrated hypocrisy, you find out pretty readily, but uncomfortably, that it's almost impossible to eradicate. First of all, it's a norm and standard in our society. That's what I was trying to hit on before. We are raised to be hypocritical. We are told that that's being polite. Hypocrisy is called plight. Remember where it says in the Bible that man will call good what is good bad and what is bad it, man will call good? It's all over our society. Every single culture you want to name. Anytime in history, anywhere in the world. I mean, you know, I, I, this is somewhat of a subjective opinion, but, you know, if you... It, if I were to look at all the cultures of the world I know something about, the ones that elevated hypocrisy as politeness to an extremely high level are basically China and England. You can understand why they did that. I'm not, I'm not trying to condemn it. I'm trying to show how, what, how a hypocrisy is integrated in our minds as a kind of virtue. I mean, I was raised on both of those cultures, so I guess that's why I pick them. I mean, I, I was, uh, I fell in love with China when I was a child, but I also fell in love with England. I didn't have very much love for the United States, and one of the things that cultures other than the United States don't like about us is that we aren't polite. That's really not true. We have our own version of politeness. But we were historically um, considered to be gruff and rough because we were honest. Okay? There are a lot of, you know, faults that I could name in American culture from the beginning. But we looked at the hypocrisy called politeness. And so we don't want it. And so we kind of had developed a sort of counterculture of being rude. That's what rude means, actually. The term, the origin, the etymology of the term rude means somebody who's like a peasant. Who doesn't have the higher manners. Okay, but manners are hypocrisy on purpose. And everybody knows it's hypocrisy. Okay, that's that's the key to this thing. In in Chinese culture, and you can ask ask anybody who knows something of Chinese culture as well as you know English culture. In all those, th there were all kinds of behaviors that were designed to mask um, honesty. They were designed to oil converse in society. And every culture has its own version. But to a very high extent, England, because she had to in order to have, you know, something to protect herself from all of her, you know, rivals around her. Because there was always a bigger country trying to take her over. Okay? It didn't just start with Rome. But Rome kind of put everything in gear. All right? And England really wasn't England at that point. But once she started to really become England, which is pretty much you know, around Elizabeth, actually, a couple of kings before her, England really came into its own then, and that's how it did so, was by developing a sort of a diplomacy, a mercantile, and what you want to call it, a politeness diplomacy and then all the machinations went on behind the scenes 
Now that they didn't invent that, but they did bring it to a much higher successful level than other Western cultures were able to do. Considering how we all got started in the West, you know, we used to wear blue and worship trees. That's a pretty, that's a lot of advance. But the advancement is in hypocrisy. It's all on the shallow. It's all on the surface. It's all on the small talk. It's the art of being nice. Okay? And China really developed it to the highest extent I've ever seen. You could argue who who did a better job of of developing the rituals and the obsequiousness and all the other trappings of culture. China or Japan? It's really a hard thing to come up with who did a more elaborate job of it. And the whole Chinese language is based on it. Okay, it's it's extremely complex. The written language, not the spoken. Spoken is easy. Written is very hard. On purpose. Now, it was done in order to mask and to create classes in society. The idea was that you could take this hypocrisy and turn it into a culture of behaviors that would define layers of people. Okay? And the higher the, the higher you were in society, frankly, the more shallow your conversation becomes. Because the idea is you don't dare talk about what do you want to call it? The unvarnished truth with others. Because you don't know if you will offend. Now that's been pitched for centuries as the proper way to be. A particular smiling courtesy, set of courtesies that are constantly between you and the other person. And they are known to be courtesies and they are known to be masks. They're worn on purpose in order to smooth relationships between specifically sovereigns but people in general and the higher in society you go the more of those courtesies you need but courtesy is a fancy name a hypocritical name for hypocrisy itself hypocrites is the actual Greek word and it means mask it was the mask in ancient Greek drama the, 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 there were, well, in very, very ancient Greek drama, you had one guy playing 16 or 17 roles, maybe not that, maybe, maybe three or four, really, in the very ancient Greek drama. And he'd have masks so that you could tell which character he was as he spoke the lines. The mask was called a hypocrites. Okay? And then, you know, as Greek drama developed, they started having, you know, multiple actors. But the idea is you wear a mask, and that's considered good. It is known to be false. Diplomacy today, even, that, that's what it's based on. So understand the first problem here, in digging a little deeper, is that hypocrisy is considered a virtue in society for the purpose of getting along and eventually that that translated into a, a whole culture of diplomacy that pretty much every nation has has played of certain vocabulary certain behavior and slight changes in the vocabulary were used and they still are today to indicate that there were there is a problem when you have the, the United States has reached a, has ha, has issuing a joint communique with Russia, and that that happened a lot during the 60s and 70s. Okay, if there's just a joint communique, it means they couldn't agree on anything. All they agreed to was to issue the communique. But you'd have to know diploma speak to understand that. To the world, it looks like, oh, we're, we're friends. There's no war going to go on between the U.S. and Russia because we issued a joint communique. 
That's hypocritical. Okay? Just because you meet and you issue a communique, that doesn't mean that you solved anything. So you wasted millions of dollars of everybody's time just to issue a communique. You could have both of us just stayed home and said, Hi, we're issuing a joint communique and have no meaning. But see, they don't do that. That's all hypocritical. That's all false. And that's the way governments treat each other. That's what they consider proper. The same thing is true in society. I had to spend 10 minutes doing that because now we're going to take that same idea and apply it to Scripture. Scripture is treated in the same way. And it's real easy to just to know that if you think about it. Look at what you're taught in school, Sunday school, or whatever you're taught in your church, typical church anyway, about what the Bible says. There probably isn't a single Christian I could find who wouldn't know who Abraham was. Not a single Christian or a single Jew. Who is Abraham of the Bible? You could pretty much ask that question to any of them. And they'd all say, oh, well, Abraham, Abraham was, you know, got circumcised and the Jews came from that. That's about all they know. Yep, that's the same as saying that the U.S. and Russia issued a joint communique. You don't know anything about Abraham. Why is he mentioned in the Bible at all? What, because he had his phallus circumcised? I don't think so. So you're given the impression that, oh, Abraham was this real big hero in the Bible. Because that's what you're essentially told, except those words aren't used. You're told some really shallow facts about his life, and those facts were never explained. Abraham was circumcised at age 99. And among the Jews in, in particular, so, oh, Abraham is our father, we're the chosen people because of Abraham. Yeah, but do you know what that means? No. Christ himself was arguing with the Jews in John 8. They didn't have a clue what it meant to be sons of Abraham. That's why he ends the chapter. Well, actually, the chapter begins with them wanting to stone a prostitute and it ends with them wanting to stone him. They wanted to stone her in the name of sin and then they wanted to stone him who was made sin as a substitute for us. John was real clever to stick the pericope adulteri at the beginning, which scholars don't know anything about because they don't understand the chapter. So is it any wonder that the Jews didn't know what Christ was talking about? When he said, before Abraham was, I am, yeah, the great I am, Exodus 3.14, lo, they should have gotten that right away. Okay, but they didn't know what it meant to be sons of Abraham. You see the point? The hypocrisy focuses on the shallow. Substitutes words and forms for meaning and then nobody asks any questions which means they don't really care which is perfectly in keeping with being hypocritical everybody knows Abraham, Isaac and Jacob and nobody knows a damn thing about them it's all right there in the Bible but then when you read the Bible what do you see? a bunch of words that you shallowly understand And who explains what it meant for Abraham to be Abraham? Oh, Abraham, we learned to chant it instead of learn what it means. Oh, Abraham left at age 75 with his father Tara from Ur the Chaldees. Yeah, and then how come, no, Abraham wasn't age 75. Tara might have been, I'm not really sure. But Terah takes Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees, and then at age 75, Abraham is told to leave his dad. And he leaves his dad, and God shows him the promised land, and he has Isaac when he couldn't have sex anymore. 
We can all recite that. Oh, and Sodom and Gomorrah, too. That, that happened before, you know, that was when God told him that he was finally going to have kids. That's a very childish set of statements. That's like, okay, the U.S. and Russia have signed a joint communique. So, tells you nothing. Because nothing happened at the summit meeting. So they have to say something. So they hypocritically come up with joint communique. That's the only thing that they can do jointly. Hi, we had a meeting. And if they really have to cover it up, they'll say, and we had a productive discussion of the issues. I mean, they couldn't come to agreement about anything. They're just as bad as it was before. And maybe we're about to go to war, but we're not going to say that. See? Hypocritical. It's like, you know, buying real estate. The real estate, the realtor agent. You got a house that's about ready to fall down, and so they'll call it a fixer-upper. Great bargain for somebody who's a do-it-yourselfer. Yeah, it's about to fall apart. What was that movie with Tom Hanks and Shelley Long about the house that they bought and it was falling apart? I forget the title of the movie. Like that. That's our knowledge of Bible, too. Oh, Abraham moved with his father, Terah, from Ur of the Chaldees, and at age 75, he, 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 what did he do? Oh, yeah, he had, God told him to get out. When did God tell him to get out? Nobody ever answers that. Well, God told him to go to the land that I will show you as the promised land. Why, why was, why was that said to Abraham? What did Abraham do that that was said to him? And what happened to his dad? Nobody asked that question. And why did he have to wait till he was 99 to have a kid? And what did that mean? Nobody asked that question. Oh, but we're from the genes of Isaac. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. We're the chosen people. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were the sons of Jacob. Mm -hmm. And do you remember that when God uses the term Jacob, it is not complimentary? The complimentary term was Israel. Prince of God, Israel, Prince. Ale of God. Oh, why did Jacob get that title? What was it he did? It's in the Bible. But we don't know why. And we don't ask. That's hypocrisy, okay? You're telling yourself that you know the Bible because you can recite the facts off the top of your head about Abraham or David slew Goliath or, you know, Paul was, you know, let down in a basket. And you tell yourself you know Bible because you can cite that stuff off. But you don't have a clue what it means. That's hypocrisy. It's a mask. You're masking your ignorance and disinterest in Bible with all these facts that you can cite off. Now I lay me down to sleep. Or the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And because you can say the Lord's Prayer, you get a little gold star. I got a, a red letter Bible for it when I was eight years old. I can say the Lord's Prayer. I knew nothing about scripture. I could barely spell God. See the point? Our whole society is like this. Christianity is completely like this. The, sh the theology in Christianity is so shallow, and I don't want to leave the Jews out. They bob in front of the Wailing Wall and call that holy. We can't get a single Bible story right when we try to put it in a movie. And if anybody criticizes those kinds of things, oh, you're not a good Christian. Well, that means you know nothing about Bible because Christ criticizes this all the time. You're not a good Christian if you don't realize just how shallow and hypocritical it is. But do you see why it's shallow and hypocritical? Because we're taught that's a virtue from the cradle. 
Now, in subsequent sub episodes, I'm going to keep on coming back to this theme about how integrated hypocrisy is, what do you want to call it, ingrained as a virtue in our lives from the cradle forward. And that accounts for a lot of why the problems you see around you, including inside yourself, exist. Because until we come to grips with the fact that we are treating hypocrisy as a virtue, we can't understand, A, why there's so much, what do you want to call it, dissension in Christianity and Judaism and religion in general because we mistake religion and God as being, you know, two sides of a coin. They're actually opposites, all right. Anything that's godly is not religion. But until you understand that religion is a type of hypocrisy, then you can't account for your own or others' shallow understanding of Scripture. We think it's proper not to know. We think it's proper to reel off some words that happen to me in the Bible and call ourselves holy. We think that's what honoring God is. Because hypocrisy, lying, is deemed polite. And criticism is deemed impolite and therefore criticism is, you know, what do you want to call it, put down, ignored, and then it has some really bad effects, like you don't know anything, like all the stuff you were doing because you were doing it for the wrong reason, being hypocritical, doesn't work like war we are so close to war right now it's not funny because the integrated hypocrisy has reached it's I, I, I want to say that we're I don't know we're at the same level of hypocrisy that the world was in 1914 you know what happened then And we might be a little behind schedule, hopefully a lot behind schedule, but we're heading toward war. When hypocrisy reaches an all-time high, that's when wars happen. Go look it up in history yourself. From the Greek city-states onward, or backward. All of China's history depends on this. Certainly all of England's. So, disinterest in the Word of God is masked by a lot of voicing of the words of God. It's like a catechism. You can repeat the words about Abraham and the generations and la di la. You can repeat the verses in scripture and you account yourself holy when you do. That's hypocrisy, baby. And the reason why it goes on generation after generation is we think it's right. We think that's what we're supposed to do. And of course, as every atheist will tell you, sooner or later, you wake up and realize, hey, you know what, this is a bunch of bunk. And the mistake the atheist makes is he throws out God with the, with the bunk. The bunk is the hypocrisy and the lack of, you know, asking questions. Why Abraham? What did he do? What was it about this guy? You don't ask the question means you don't want to know. You don't want to know means you're not interested in scripture. If you're not interested in scripture, you're certainly not going to be learning and living on it. And then sooner or later, you're going to come up with your own fakakta answers about why. And sooner or later, because they're messed up answers, I don't dare translate fakakta. Go ask a person who speaks Yiddish. Sooner or later, those answers being false are going to show themselves up as false, and you're going to lose faith. 
So, of course, the atheist loses faith. But he shouldn't be mingling God in the equation. Lose faith in religious? Yeah. Lose faith in the claims? Yeah. That doesn't mean there's no God. But we don't do that. We live lives of hypocrisy and then one day when the hypocrisy becomes so obvious you can't overlook it anymore. Oh, I'm offended. You were lying all this time. You were hypocritical. I thought you loved me. I thought there were, I prayed to God and asked him for this and this and I went to church every Sunday like the pastor said I should do. But there's no rule in the Bible that you should do it. But you didn't look in the Bible, did you? You lived on the hypocrisy of the pastor who made up whatever he wanted, slapped God's name on it, or some dear doctor so-and-so, and you listened to him. You didn't investigate the Bible for yourself. So, of course, what he says turns false. Jeremiah 25 and 29. If someone claims to be speaking something in my name, that's why I tell you, don't believe me. Ask God yourself. If someone claims to be speaking in my name and they really are, then I will make it come to pass. And if it doesn't come to pass, they're not talking for me. Jeremiah, what was it? 25, 28, 29. Go read it yourself. And then ask yourself a question. Where am I a hypocrite? Because we all are. It's part and parcel of being human. It's not strictly a function of the sin nature, although you can say the source is the sin nature. Because Adam was hypocritical the minute he sinned. You know, the woman you gave me. Yeah, it's all your fault, God, that I took the fruit. See, he's lying. Hypocrisy and lying are two sides of a coin. So where are we being hypocritical? And why are we being hypocritical? Ask yourself those questions. And try to notice just how endemic hypocrisy is in society and how much it's called politeness and virtue and being well-mannered. So that next week when I get into this business of hypocrisy deeper, it'll have more resonance. And of course, talk to God. Don't ever believe me. My my job is I, to learn it myself. And then if, if he's got a job for you to listen, it's because he won't, it's like brainstorming. So brainstorm with God about this. See you next week.